About a mile in that direction is Winchester. It's quite a sleepy place today, but it hasn't always been like that. In the 9th century, King Alfred made it his capital, and it remained the top city in Norman England until London finally overtook it. But while Winchester was thriving, not all of its citizens were enjoying the boom. This field lies just outside the city boundaries, and 900 years ago, it was home to a community of Winchester's outcasts. The men who lived here were united by a terrible bond, a disease that disfigured their bodies and condemned them to a life of exile, a disease called leprosy. Somewhere under here lie the remains of a 12th century leper hospital. But this wasn't just any old leper hospital. It had living quarters, a master's house, a huge cemetery, and this fantastic chapel. And Time Team have got just three days to find them. Start of day one, and geophysics are already well into their stride. They're surveying a long strip of land cutting right across our site. They're looking for building remains and traces of the wall which we think used to go round the site of the leper hospital. I don't understand. We've got this picture of the most fantastic chapel. Yeah. And yet the people who would have worshipped there would have been the poorest people in the whole town. Uh, yeah, but I think that's to do with the patrons, the rich families who are endowing the hospital. That's their insurance policy. That's their ticket to heaven by giving money to set the place up. So that's why there's a, such a contrast. What do you got, Dick? Well, as you can see here, we've got um, a collection of finds, some of which seem to be quite important. That's um, fantastic, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Let's have a look at this. A nice bit of encaustic tile. This is definitely medieval, is it? Indeed. Oh. Well, I'm not sure about that, but that definitely is, yes. This would be the floor of either the chapel or one of the main buildings, Indeed, wouldn't yep. it? Yeah. If it's the leper hospital, but yeah. how do we know that this is the leper hospital? Well, the location of the site just outside the city. Yeah. Um, no one wanted a leper hospital next to them. Um, the name of the site, St Mary Magdalene, is always associated with uh, mm. leper hospitals, other hospitals. The locals call this field Hospital Field and have done for a long time. <laughs> yeah, they never really forget that no, there's been no, something no. in the It does the seem area. a pretty good clue, yeah. doesn't it? Well, and you walk yeah. across it, there yeah. is all this stuff yeah. here, isn't there? And, and uh, on top of that, a number of years ago, there were some, a few small test pits were dug, yeah. uh, which seemed to indicate, again, that there are some good remains yeah. still to be seen. So what kind of things are we hoping that we might find? Well, we ought to try and get the layout of the buildings because we're not really sure how, you know, it was, whether it was one block or several blocks. Uh, to find the chapel would be nice, of course. Uh, there also must be a big cemetery of all the people that died here. How do we set about it? Well, we've got the geophys going, and uh, that ought to be quite good here because it, I think it's just chalk, isn't it, that we're That's on? That's right, yes, yeah. So, you know, we often get good results on that. But we've also got Bernard trying to relocate those test pits because uh, they found stuff, and the obvious thing would be to reopen one or two of those as well. We've asked Bernard, our surveyor, to pinpoint the earlier trenches because we know they contained building remains. But why are Geophys looking so pleased with themselves? I don't believe this. Three metres, two metres, one metre. You're joking. Oh, that's brilliant. What's this? Well, look. Look over here. Look. This point here, right, and this point here, this is where we want the trench to be because this is right on top of the building that we think is here in the geophysics. So what you're saying is then, you've got uh, geophysics anomalies there that show buildings, yeah. and that tallies with the trench one and the evaluation, yeah. which also had building remains, which is here. I mean, so, the only reason we surveyed here is because as you walked over, you know, there's quite a bit of flint rubble and so on. But how certain can you be that this is where the trench is? I've positioned this very accurately, but what the variable quality is, is how well this was uh, recorded when they dug the trench. The crucial thing, though, is that it is likely that this thing here, which we think is a building, is the same, same. thing that, as that. Yeah, so that, it doesn't matter, that, we're in the yeah, same that, ballpark. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that is the crucial thing. That is, yeah, we're, that is the we're, crucial thing. Let's start, we've got to start. So with the rain falling, in goes our first trench. Hopes are high that there's a building under here, and the early signs are promising. Hmm? 
tell you what, that'd go well in a wall, that would. That's a bit of flint, that is. That would. I'm not, not doubting that. you. I'm not doubting you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is. That'd, that'd fit building well. Look at that. It wouldn't work better than Ashwood Ash Tumble. But one flint doesn't make a building. We'll find out later what's waiting to be discovered in Trench 1. We've set up our incident room in the local girls' school, where Robin's piecing together the early history of the site. He's come across some 18th century illustrations of the hospital which could provide valuable information to the team. Meanwhile, Stuart's also in Sherlock Holmes mode, investigating early maps for clues to the layout of the site. Evidence suggests it stood within a five-sided boundary wall, and Stuart thinks this aerial photo may show the faint traces of that wall. Up on site, work's continuing in Trench 1. We've already found remains of a wall, so Carenza's opening a second trench next door to try and pick up the end of the building. We know our hospital must have had a cemetery too. We're really keen to find that, as any skeletons could give us crucial information about leprosy in medieval England. So we've invited forensic scientist Margaret Cox along. We haven't dug this lot up, have we? No, these are actually from Chichester, from the leper hospital cemetery excavation there. What is leprosy? It's a bacterial disease that affects the peripheral nervous system. And because you get a loss of feeling or an anaesthesia associated with that, then you damage your soft tissues, they get infected, and the infection tracks in and actually damages the bone. So what should our diggers be looking for? Well, the sorts of things they won't expect to find are a different face. And if we look at this one here, for example, this is a male... And if you look at him, he's actually lost the, the nasal spine and, and the edges here have resorbed and become very round. You've got the, the bone that supports the teeth here is all, also pulling back. And so you lose your front teeth as well. So you get a very flattened, collapsed front of face. We're sifting through the evidence from trenches one and two. No bones yet, and the building we've found doesn't look like our prime target, the chapel. Maybe we're having more luck in the hunt for the boundary wall. John, how's the jiffies going? Look, that's the resistance. We've got a really nice building, and that, that's worked well. Now, that slots into that square there. Yeah. We've surveyed a long strip magnetically, and I can't find any boundary sort of ditches, limits to the precinct at all. Stuart! <laughs> we can't find the boundary. I think we might be able to help you out there a bit, Tony. Go on. We've been looking at the, the old maps and the air photographs and so on, and we've identified that we're in the right field. And one of the parish boundaries which comes along here gives us the area that is extra parochial. This is the area within which the, the lepers would have lived. What's this little kink here? Well, this kink corresponds exactly to where the pentagonal enclosure is shown on one of the 18th century maps. Uh -huh. Now, if you look at the air photographic evidence, we have these lines which are showing up as light colours in the chalk, and this is the pentagonal-shaped enclosure we've been looking for. It's clear as day here. Why haven't you got it? Well, I think we were hoping there were going to be boundary ditches there, and clearly there aren't. Could they have just been ploughed out? Possible, yeah. Well, that looks lo relatively clean and clear-cut there, but there is one complication to add. What's all this? This is at a very, very big First World War army camp, which was built right across the site. I mean, we've got a detailed plan of it, which Ray Sands actually transcribed onto here, so we can work out where all the roads and buildings were. And the way it's plotted out here, you can see, that's where the chapel site is likely to be and the boundaries. The camp hasn't seriously impinged on it either. Mm. Back on site, we think we've picked up a trace of the World War I camp already. But it could actually help in our search for the layout of the medieval hospital. We know our hospital had a well, as lepers weren't allowed to use public water supplies. When the army was stationed here, they adapted the well and put a metal wind pump on top. Geophys think they've located the remains of the wind pump. If they're right, we could be on the trail of a medieval well. We think it's worth a new trench to find out. Come on, come on. Be a well, be a well. How's it coming on then, Victor? Margaret's still waiting for our first skeletons to turn up. 
In the meantime, she's working with Victor on a sculpture to show the facial damage caused by leprosy. The first stage is to build a precise copy of this leper's skull, which was discovered in a previous excavation. The skull has damage to the nose and upper jaw, which would have dramatically altered the sufferer's appearance. Once he's copied the skull shape, Victor will start to build up the muscle layers which help to define the shape of the face. The building in trenches one and two is beginning to take shape as well, although it's not the chapel. But we know that's here somewhere because we've got these illustrations of the site. They were made in 1788, just before the buildings were demolished. Meanwhile, Robin's been finding out when the hospital was founded. I've got references from 1148 onwards of varying kinds, and I would push it back slightly to, say, the 1130s, possibly 1140s. And who founded it? Well, since we know it was a Bishop of Winchester, that would identify Henry of Blois. And who was he? Uh, oh, he couldn't have been more important, really, if he tried, other than being Archbishop of Canterbury. He'd become, apart from anything else, he was the grandson of William the Conqueror, he became abbot of Glastonbury, the wealthiest monastery of England, in 1126. And in 1129, he becomes Bishop of Winchester, one of the most valuable uh, bishoprics in England. But he also was a great building bishop. We know from 1138, for instance, he built six castles, just like that. Uh, and in Winchester and in Glastonbury, and all over his, his vast estates, he is the, one, the chap who initiates building activity. But Stuart may be on the verge of a breakthrough. This 18th century plan clearly shows the position of the chapel within the boundary wall. Stuart already knows where the boundary wall is because you can see it faintly in this aerial photo of the site. So if he overlays the plan onto the aerial photo, that should pinpoint the exact location for the chapel on the ground. Well, that's the theory anyway. We'll find out later if it works in practice. Oh my goodness, there's a big oval. Back in Trench 3, Jenny and Barney have uncovered the first evidence of the well. This must have been a, a metal strut actually attached to a, a post of wood sunk into the ground and the wood's now rotted away. So it looks like a void. Yeah. And how, is it free if you wobble it or is it? No, it pretty seems solid. Pr pretty solid. So it's going down, I mean you can see it's going down a long way. <laughs> I can't see where the bottom is actually. No. But you feel quite stable there at the moment. Yeah, I think this is sunk into the earth rather than it being a big void. And I think okay. maybe this was something to do with the, the, the wind pump, which we were hoping would be sat on top of where we think the leper hospital's well was right. to get the water out of the old well. OK. But this is clearly nothing to do with the, the leper hospital so well. It's, it's a modern thing. So the, we're going to have to go down yeah, for the well? Yeah, I think so, yeah. OK. We're nearing the end of day one, and we've now got three trenches up and running. But there's still no sign of our main targets, the boundary wall, the chapel, and the leper cemetery. It's all very frustrating. But maybe our luck's about to change. Now, there are rumours <laughs> that you agree for a change. Oh, we always agree, don't we, John? <laughs> Do you remember earlier on, Tony, with the computer, you asked me what that was? Yep, and I said that was the southern limit of the precinct that we were looking for yeah well we've got this map of 1780s yeah. which shows the precinct the chaplain saw that is the southern boundary we've scaled it onto that and once you do that the whole thing drops in with the soil mark that was shown on the air photograph that goes straight up there that goes along that hedge boundary comes back along that mark and then back down there which means we can now identify exactly where exactly that where chapel that is, site yeah. is. And it's in that area there where that dark patch is. And where is that in here? We're actually stood on the northwest corner of the chapel here that Bernard set out. Right. He's currently setting out the northeast corner over there. It's not bad for them. <laughs> Come on, John, what have you got? Well, we've extended our survey. That was the building we had this morning in yeah. the resistance. Yeah. And now we've got this really nice anomaly here. And that looks as though it goes with the north wall of the church. Mm, yeah. So in effect, that's how the church sits. It seems to me we should put something across that then, shouldn't we? Once, once you've done the rest of that. Yeah. Will we do that tonight? 
Well, we could do. I mean, you know, we, we want to look and see what's inside the chapel in case there's burials there, but we also want to go outside, and yeah. those the cemetery ought to be on the other side. Yeah, well, on the air photograph, we had this enclosure showed up. That's where the chapel site is, or that dark mark is. Yeah. And that shows up, and I think that might be the cemetery on the south side yeah. of the chapel, so, yeah, we ought to go there. Okay, we, so we've wasted a day, but we're going to get down no, to we oh, haven't. No, we haven't. We'll, we'll, go, and, we'll go and get the digger. Sort him out. We haven't. It's been incredibly useful, all this. So as we prepare to open Trench 4, here's the state of play. Thanks to Stuart, we now know where the boundary wall was. And if we focus on the area inside the wall, we've found buildings in Trenches 1 and 2, though we don't know what they are yet. Trench 3 may lead down to a medieval well. Finally, Stuart and Geofiz both agree that new Trench number 4 should, fingers crossed, contain the north wall of the chapel. Oh wow, look at that. Bang on the line as well. Oh, there it is. Yeah. That's, that's oh, a, what's that's that, a couple of facing oh. stones? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's the end of day one, and after a fairly fruitless day, whatever Mick might say, we've finally hit what could well be the chapel. And if that's the chapel, then over here should be the cemetery, which means with a bit of luck, tomorrow we should be excavating bodies. Beginning of day two, just before we went home last night, we came down on what we thought might be part of the chapel. Is it, Barney? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's the north wall of the chapel. It's in really good nick. So the chances are that inside the chapel over there, we might even get medieval floor levels. And what's the significance of that? Well, it'd be great because we might find tile floors or burials. So where are you? We're right there. If that wasn't enough, after we'd all gone home, Phil stayed here rootling around. What were you looking for, Phil? What we wanted to find is was the east wall. It's the most sacred part of the chapel. It's where the altar is, Tony. And have you got it? Yes, we've, it's incredibly heavily robbed. But if you really needed any proof at all, look, we've got our first piece of beautiful moulded stone. Excellent. It's from the main window, and we should be able to tie that in with a 1788 illustration. So where are you? We're there. Which means that according to our plan, 27 foot over in this direction, round about where this hat is, there should be the door out of the chapel into the leper cemetery. Which is exactly where Mick's opening our next trench. So now we've got six trenches up and running. In trenches one and two, we've discovered two sides of the same building. In Trench 3, we think we've located the well which supplied the leper hospital. Trenches 4 and 5 contain the north and east walls of the chapel. And Trench 6 is taking us into what we think is the leper cemetery. In Trench 5, Katie's found our first bones. It looks like they've been buried just outside the chapel. This, for example, this rib is, actually, is from a child, quite a, a young child, child as Why well. Why would there be... Do children get leprosy? Children can get leprosy, but, it, but often um, leprous people had their wives and children living with them. And so, you know, there may well have been children here. It's, it's not, they're not to be precluded. If we get an intact skeleton in that grave mm. cut, is that going to be more helpful than just these bits and pieces? Well, yes, because if we get a whole skeleton, then we can look at the different areas of the skeleton where we might see leprous changes and see whether or not we've got somebody who had leprosy. So, Katie, what are you going to do now? Well, we're going to obviously have to extend the trench so that we can find the end of the grave cut. You've only got the foot end at the moment. Yeah, so I'll have to go and get the digger driver. Right. Barney! Oh, there you are! I couldn't see We've you. moved Barney to the cemetery <laughs> trench. Well, we're doing quite well. Um, down at that end, we've got the south wall of the chapel. More interestingly, just between the two of us, just there... What, this other thing here? Yeah. That's another wall. That's definitely structural, much smaller, and it's possibly something like a porch. Yeah. What about down here, though? Because we should have got bones. And we... I'm having a nightmare. Are you having a nightmare? <laughs> yes. What is that? Well, I've got disarticulated bone, yeah. and I've got a cluster of bones down here. Can you see them? Yeah. There's a bit of a skull and then a couple of vertebrae there, but no grave cut, and the rest of the body's completely vanished. 
So I, fi I think we've got evidence for cemetery, but it's all disturbed. So this is where they've they've redug it and redug it. It's all. I fear so. You yeah. don't even think yeah. it's necessarily one body, presumably. Mm, I, I can't tell. It's too jumbled right. up. So what do, would you suggest we go? We carry I, on out. I think it would be a good idea to carry on with this one and see if there's any undisturbed graves underneath. Margaret, have a look at those while oh, you're thanks, there. Phil. Phil's found our first grave, but it's inside the chapel where the posh people were buried, so it's unlikely to be a leper. Margaret thinks it's a female, and John Crook, our architecture expert, has a theory about who it might be. Just as a working hypothesis, I can supply a female who was buried on the south side, and that's Mrs Elizabeth Simmons, who died on the 12th of September 1695, aged 90 years. So she was born in 1605. Yeah. Now her dad, John Ebden, uh, sometime master of this hospital, is also buried there, according to the other source that we have, who says that I think he, he died in 1614 when he was 98. So, so I'm not a mathematician, but that makes him 90 when she was He born? must have been about 90 when, so he can, yes. Good God. Conceived at age 89. That's a very healthy part of the world, isn't it? Must be good air up here. Phil, don't yeah. Be... <laughs> I will check the, I'll I check think, the dates of these, check these, check these the people, I think. It's easy so we may have a father and daughter both buried in the same part of the chapel. Over in the incident room, Victor's been hard at work on his bust of a medieval leper. And you can already begin to see the terrible physical impact of the disease. So how were lepers viewed back in the Middle Ages? You could make the comparison with how people regarded AIDS about 20 years ago. They were very afraid that they might catch it. They thought that the people who had it were repulsive because, of course, leprosy does disfigure you. Also, they uh, associated leprosy with sex. They thought that one of the ways in which it was transmitted was sexually. They thought that lepers were more lustful than ordinary people. And so just as with AIDS, there was this sort of feeling, you know, these are people who've behaved wickedly and that's why they're like this. How did they look after lepers? By segregating them. Um, outside the town, they had space for a garden, they had a field with, uh, they could grow corn, they could pasture animals, and they would live in, in a kind of village and, and look after themselves. So how many leper houses were there altogether? Well, we know of about uh, 300 documented ones, oh, don't we? And we might add, we right. might say there are a few we don't know about. So it's going to be somewhere between 300 and 350. You've also got to distinguish between thought. hospitals that cared specifically for lepers, or were stated to do so, and those who just cared generally for the sick in various ways. Look at that. Oh, yeah. That's... Phil's uncovered a skull in Trench 5. I mean, the trouble is, what I don't understand is what it appears to be doing in the middle of the grave cut. I mean, we've got superb coffin imprint. Look, the stain goes down there. Yeah. Look at it. And there is That's actually got, got the wood in it. It's incredible. And then there's the other end of it, and it comes back up the other end. Yeah. And it butts up against this side of the grave. Obviously, once I clean the whole lot mm. back, I should get the whole shape of the, of the coffin. We, I mean, the only thing that occurs to me at the moment is for the foot end of a grave, you know, that is actually not very big, even for an adult. And, and I just wonder if we haven't actually got a child's coffin in here, maybe on top of earlier coffins. But if that is a, an indication of the condition of the bone... Yeah, it looks good, doesn't it? I think you'll be yeah. very pleased to yeah, work I with that so. one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Jenny? Is this no entry tape? Yes. Can I come in? As long as you're careful. I will be. What's the problem? Well, we have we found the wind pump that was here for the First World War Army camp. Um, and we think it's on top of the medieval well, so we're just being careful until we know what's going on. Why are we interested in a medieval well? Because I think it would be a really critical part of the leper hospital. They couldn't survive without their own fresh water supply. And if you could get one here, then it would be a good reason for it to be here. How do we find out how deep it is? I think we have to drop something down it and time it. Oh, we must do that. We must do it. It'll be very exciting. Bob, can we use one of the one of our spare mics? These are the things that we all wear, so we could hear the sound of something going down there. <laughs> right, how are we going to do this? Right, if you tell me when you let go of that, I'll press yes on the stopwatch. What, this? Yeah. This is what's going in? I think so, it's nice and heavy. Okay, hang on. I'll say one, two, three, go, alright? Okay. One, two, three, go! How long do you reckon? About 
about six seconds. And what does that mean? Well, um, I think it's six, six times six is 36 times... Uh, you don't know, you uh, don't know. 36. Could be about 100 metres, I reckon. Yeah? That sound right? I don't know, what's that in feet? Uh, 300 feet, it's a long way. Do you think we ought to check it? I think we should probably get somebody else to do the sum. <laughs> we could do a plumb line thing down, couldn't we? Yeah, that's the other thing, drop something with a string on. We'll... Maybe 300 feet, but we'll measure it again later on. Yesterday it took us ages to find the chapel, but today we're making much better progress as we attempt to slot together the pieces of our medieval jigsaw. And it looks as though things are about to get even better. John, have you got the jiffies? There you are. Oh, cool. geophysics. Absolutely that, fantastic, isn't it? Wow. The whole site laid out. We're just comparing it with the 18th century map, and you can see the church there, which is this block, which is what we're digging over here. And next to that, there's a thing described as the master's house on, the, on this map. What does that mean? Well, we think it's probably the chap in charge of either the lepers early on or the, you know, the people who are in the arms house later on. And that must be that area there, John, mustn't it? We've got yeah. a mass of stuff there. And then these two little buildings here are part of this great north range, which um, there's a description of in the 18th century, but it doesn't show it on the map. You mm. can see the foundations. But that fits in very nicely with this prospect of the 1770s. And we, we did think that this range might be a sort of spurious invention, but it's clearly there now as a row of almshouses. So we've got the church, master's house, North Range on, you know, each source of information. And the boundary wall, don't forget. Which you couldn't find yesterday. <laughs> but you found now. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Our plan of the site's really taking shape. In trenches one and two, we now know that we've found the almshouses where the lepers lived. And in trenches four and five, we've located the chapel. So, what's the next target? We want to look at the master's house, see what sort of condition that's in. If we come from that across into this north range, so across there somewhere, we should be able to look at, look at both. Yeah. How deep do you think it was last time? Um, we had a bit Back at the well, we're adopting a more basic measurement technique this time. This tape's actually 100 metres long, so let's go. Whoa! It's smoking! It's smoking! Is it? <laughs> I'm going to get a tape fast. Oh, I'm um, actually out of tape. There is the red line. I mean, there's still weight on the end of that. So Mick the Dig needs to find another tape measure. Meanwhile, Margaret's catching up with Katie's burials in Trench 5. Yeah. I found some bits of jaw, so I don't know if you can tell if it's a, a man or a woman. That looks... Yeah, that's, that's male. That's flaring nicely there. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Margaret? Yeah? You've got a minute. Oh, God. <laughs> Can I drag you away? What have you got now? I've <laughs> got, got another skull. <laughs> oh my God, look at that. That's fantastic, isn't There's it? There's loads more coffin nails again. So, so this is a bit strange, isn't it? Because we seem to have two skulls in the same coffin. We do seem to have two, two skulls in the same coffin, yeah. It's a really good condition. And we're, we're still on the, on the top of the head, very much on the top yeah. of the head, aren't we? Oh yeah, definitely. And there's no indication no indication of sutures. No, might mean it's an older person. Yeah. So I hadn't actually anticipated that I was going to get a skull at this level. It's always the same, isn't it? You just never know quite where they're going to crop up next. No. Yeah. At the well, we're adding tape measure number two in our quest to reach the bottom. That is 150 metres. That is absolutely... And it's still, it is still pulling when I let go. So yeah. Has anybody got another tape? This is getting silly. Okay. We're on to tape measure number three now. So this is our last 30 metres. Is it still going? But even three tapes tied together won't stretch far enough to reach the bottom. <laughs> I don't know what to do. We haven't got any more tapes. The hole is more than 180 metres deep. That's incredible. More than 550 feet in old money. Sadly, though, we've had to call off the well excavation. The risk of it collapsing is just too high. 
But as we near the end of our whirlwind day two, our other trenches are really helping us piece together the shape of our medieval hospital. So what have we got here? Well, this is a 17th century fireplace. I mean, quite sweetly, when we dug it, there was a whole pile of ash with masses of clay pipes in it, like all these old boys living in the almshouses have been sitting smoking by the fire and throwing the pipes in it. And in here we've got the walls of the almshouses. You can see there's a wall across the back there and then one in right down here should probably have gone on and on and they're really well built. I know what this one is. This is the uh, new trench, isn't it, where we're trying to get the master's house. That's right. And you can see already those walls are looking much better built than the almshouses ones. We haven't had many finds to help us date the almshouses, but the building style's the same as the chapel. And we know that's 12th century or earlier. So here we're into the chapel and you can see that big lump of stone there. That's one of the piers. And then over here, we're right into the centre of the chapel. Phil Strange. That's right. Is that a skull you got there, Phil? Well, we've actually got at least two bodies in here, Tony. It's quite amazing. It's really interesting. <laughs> we've got other burials outside the church where Katie is. She's out in the graveyard. Um, and interesting, it's probably where the lepers were buried outside and the, the patrons of the whole establishment would be buried in here. So we carried on to try and find the rest of the church plan. This is still inside the yes, church? Yes, we're yeah? all inside the church yeah. here. There's probably the other piers here. And then coming along here, we've got the south wall. Again, you can see with those flint cobbles lining it. And look, lovely bits of the masonry that would have um, you know, made up the really ornamental bits Beautiful. of the church. And then we're outside again into the graveyard. And are these bones what we've been finding here? Yes, more human bones. And you can see we've got, well, two skulls in that grave again. So it looks like another double burial. It's been a fantastic day two, but there are still plenty of questions left to answer on day three. Do any of our skeletons have the telltale signs of leprosy? What more can we discover about the buildings where the lepers lived? How many people do you think are actually in there then, Phil? And will we solve the puzzle of Phil's mysterious chapel burials? It's the start of day three and the weather's turned against us. But we're not letting that dampen our spirits as we race to complete our picture of Winchester's medieval leper hospital. Our new trench is targeting the hospital's boundary wall and the gatehouse which gave access to the site. I hope we find something to cheer these three up. Margaret's still searching for a skeleton with the signs of leprosy. In trench five, Katie's found an unusual chalk-lined tomb with a pair of legs inside. The rest of the skeleton was probably destroyed when a later burial was placed on top of it. It's, it's very unusual to see feet like this propped up against the stone. I don't think I've ever seen it like them before. So well preserved, aren't Yeah, they? they're in very good condition. Mm. I've well, got, there's some loose ones. Oh, right. You can oh, yeah. tell from that. It's very thin, isn't it? Which is one of the things we look for with leprosy, where you get the eventual destruction of the, the joint surface and end up with a sort of pencil tip shaped right. bone. But whether it's significantly thin or not, I don't really know. I need to look at all of the foot bones. It could just be somebody who's very slender in build. But we've not just been finding skeletons, our trenches have also produced some fantastic stonework. But can we match any of it with our 18th century illustrations of the chapel? Yes, absolutely, and that's what's fantastic about the things that are coming out of these trenches. Let, let's have a start with that one. Now, you see this little sort of pie crust decoration? Now, do you, you recognise it there? Absolutely. Probably that, that very arch. The others seem to be a bit different. And what about my little piece? Well, that's, that's the best of, best of the lot, really, as far as the 12th century is concerned. Over the high altar, you've got this zigzag or chevron decoration. And there was an actual piece of it. I just now, thought you, that was just paint. Yeah, it does look like paint, but it's not. What this, this shows, of course, is that this is actual real architecture. Would all these arches have been made at the same time, or could they be from different periods? Well, I think they're probably, probably what this shows, because we've got the, the same geology, the same sort of tooling, uh, that these arches are indeed 12th century, examples of late uh, transitional architecture, rather than sort of 14th century stuff, as one might have thought. What about this bizarre looking thing here? Well, that's perhaps the loveliest of the lot. There's not much in the way of what you'd call liturgical furniture in these pictures, but there is this niche which presumably held a statue. It had an ornamental top, which you can see there, and here is part of that very top. What are these red things here? You're sort of looking up 
into the head of the niche, within the head itself, rather like a sort of acoustic hood, there were ribs. And at the point where the ribs sprout, there are these kinds of, well, are they leaves? They look actually more like, well, raspberries, I think <laughs> oh. you would say. So what would have been standing here? A saint, no doubt. A statue of a saint, probably St Mary Magdalene, the, the patron of the hospital itself. So if I'm the saint yes, here, well, how does that try and put that up above your head. So. There you go, Margaret. Oh, great. Yesterday, Barney uncovered what looked like a double burial, until it turned out that one of the skulls wasn't actually attached to a body, but the other skeleton's almost complete, and if the hand shows signs of damage, this could be our first leper. Well, we've got more of the right hand out than the left, yeah. and it's in very good condition, but they so, don't look as though there are any changes from leprosy there. So. Oh, OK. So not immediately a Not leper. immediately, no. Yeah. We can have a look at the feet as well and see what they're doing. Yeah. Very, oh, well. you know... There it goes. They're all there. What about other things, like, uh, is it a man or a woman? Or It's one of those individuals that's not easy to sex. It could be a male, it could be a female. I really need to look at it properly to right. be able to tell that. The sooner we can get it out and have a look yeah. at it properly, the better. We're still digging for the boundary wall and gatehouse, but as the rain worsens, are the results anything to smile about? I've got a bed of natural clay here, and I've got some kind of cut going this way. So it could be the, the uh, robber trench the actual precinct wall but I'll carry on digging that way get the other side of it and then we'll go into it and see if there's any of the wall left so come in oh yeah come in Tony oh <laughs> you two up to no good yeah <laughs> cool what can you tell us about these Margaret well we're trying to work out what's going on Tony yesterday we thought we possibly had two burials that have been disturbed and reburied here because there seemed to be a jumble of bones then we keep on getting glimpses of bones that are actually articulated, such as the bottom of those legs it's down there. there. But they're far too far away from this head to relate to it. So this person would have very short legs and a huge long spine, which doesn't stack up either. And we've also got a part of a pelvis here with the, the femur running off of it, but it's by somebody's head. <laughs> so it makes no sense at all. Do we know anything about these people's sex? I think this is a female, but I'm not 100% sure yet. Uh, and that one, I, th I think, is a male. And in a way, one of, the, one of the prime things is to actually get the bones out of the ground, let Margaret have a look at them and see whether she can actually make two complete skeletons out of them. The weather's getting worse by the minute. We're racing to tie up as many loose ends as possible before the whole site just gets washed away. How many, how many people do you think are actually in there, then, Finally, in the cemetery trench, a breakthrough in our search for a leper. We can now say that this is a male. Right. The pelvis and the skull both indicate that. But although we've got none of the leprous changes to the hands and feet, we actually have got the beginning of remodelling of the nasal bones. Right. And so this edge here, which is usually sharp, is actually rounded and the nasal spine is, is resorbed. So he could have been a leper? He could have been in the early stages of leprosy, right. yeah. So at last, we found the first evidence of a possible leper burial, and we've made progress in the other trenches too. It's like it's all turned to mush, Mick, but did you find the boundary? Yes, this mush, as you call it, is actually the fill of a rubber trench. So it's a trench cut for a wall, not yes, a boundary it, ditch? it's not big enough for a ditch. It's, it's, it's the right size for quite a substantial wall. Did you get any dating evidence Unfortunately, for it? Unfortunately, no. It's, it, I just can't dig it. It's just, it's, it's just like soup. <laughs> but at least we now understand where the precinct boundary was. Oh, absolutely. We've got fixed points on the chapel and we've got fixed points on the boundary. I think we've positively identified the extent of the leper hospital. 
We've had to close down the chapel trench too, but it's already given us lots of useful information about the centrepiece of the hospital. Jenny, we have to stop. Yeah, definitely. Which just leaves the master's house. It's filling with water. So but you think you understand it now? I think so, yeah. We've got quite a nice picture now. We've got the back wall of the master's lodging. Mm. Yeah. And then this big wall here is the is the north range, the arms house, probably where the lepers actually would have been living. Yeah. Um, and then in between the two, which is nice, we've got this little alleyway with a nice flint floor. I think probably it would have run all the way along here and then all the way up to the north door of the church so that you they could basically go to church without getting wet. <laughs> <laughs> so would that have been covered over? I hope so. I think so, yeah. <laughs> So in one respect at least, they'd have been better off than we are. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, can we go home now? Come on. We've got 45 mile an hour winds forecast. The rain's still sheeting down, so we're going to have to call it a day. But it's been a fantastic three days archaeology, and the excitement of what we've found has made even these appalling conditions just about bearable. But we're not going home yet. We may have stopped digging, but there's unfinished business to deal with back in the incident room. So have you managed to sort it out? I think we've been able to establish some quite interesting facts about this field. Right. We've very quickly been able to establish the precinct boundary. Yeah. Uh, this is the area marked in here. We've been referring to it as a pentangle, as if there's something mysterious about yeah, it. Yeah. But all it is, is a regular shape which has been added to an already existing boundary. Ah, that's why right. that side is odd. And it's probable that that boundary all the way around there is the original 12th century piece of land given to the lepers. But one of the real highlights for me, actually, is in looking at the maps and the, the development through the ages. Yeah. And if we look at from this angle, we've got the leper hospital precinct here. And you can see Winchester at the back. Yeah. In 1887, next door, the Winchester Council built the Royal Victoria Isolation Hospital <laughs> for Infectious Diseases yeah. next door. Yeah. And you know there's a First World War army camp yeah. here. Yeah. Well, these red blocks next to our site were disinfection houses. Oh, okay. So you've you had continuity right through to... Right the way through for the last 900 years yeah. or so. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic, isn't it? Three days ago, our site was an empty field. But now we've pieced together the layout of the buildings which made up the Mary Magdalene Leper Hospital. We've located the wall which surrounded it. And we found the chapel, the master's house, the almshouses where the lepers lived, and the cemetery where they were buried. But what about those puzzling burials in Phil's trench? Oh, Margaret, you've finally sorted out my <laughs> jumble of bones. Well, I've tried to. I've tried Put me to. out of my misery how many people were in there. <laughs> there are two. There are two adults, um, as we thought at the time. And we've got a female there. That's a female pelvis. Is that the one that was articulated? Yeah, that, that is. Right. And we've got these pelvic bones as well, which I think were all over the place, and they're from a male, probably. Mm. It's actually very incomplete, but probably from a male. And how old are they? Well, there are a couple of things that suggest that they're actually quite, you know, quite old. The really interesting thing we've got is this ossified cartilage. This is actually the cartilage that protects the, the larynx and the Good vocal Lord. cords. And when you get older, this turns to bone, effectively. Look, we've got a male and a female, yep. and they're both... Very old. Well, they're, they're the, old, yes, pretty old. This is beginning to ring like the, the father and daughter story it that we is, were thinking yeah, about. It is, yeah, it's uncanny. Um, and the thing that really, for me, makes me think that that could well be what we have here is if you look at the skulls, if you put mm. them in profile, like that, you'll see that they both have very, very unusual shaped heads. They're unusual. They're really long. And to see two people with the same head shape in the same grave when we know that there are a related couple buried in that area, it is does actually, actually indicate that we might have the canon and his daughter. It is actually uncanny. It uh, is. Which very, one have I got? Similar. You've got him. Good Lord. So I could actually be holding the skull of John Ebden, canon of Winchester, and formerly master of the college here. Yeah, you could. 
It's incredible, isn't it? But John Ebden and his daughter walked the grounds of our site many years after leprosy had disappeared from Britain. There are many others resting here whose names are long forgotten, who are far less fortunate than the Ebdens. You know what this reminds me of? When I was a kid, uh, there was a Robert Louis Stevenson book, I can't remember which one it was, but there's uh, a leper that comes in throughout the whole book and his head is always covered by this cowl. And I used to wonder what hideous deformities lay underneath. And now, looking at this chap, I realise that it's not just the pustules and the squash nose and the, the lip. It's the fact that underneath all that, you can still see an unblemished human being looking out of it with those blank, staring eyes. As the team seems to be touring cathedral cities, join us in Canterbury at the same time tomorrow. After the break, the battlefield detectives use their savvy on the Spanish Armada.